How's artificial intelligence shaping our society? From offices to living rooms, devices with human-like characteristics are quickly creeping into our lives. But besides the benefits, what are the risks? And will AI take over the world one day? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. Now, many of us interact every day with Siri, Apple's voice-activated digital personal assistant. Siri can find information, gives us directions, sends messages, plays music. One example of how AI is becoming a bigger part of everyday life. Chances are it's on all your devices, can mimic areas of human behaviour and could soon learn about our feelings and our emotions. The key sentence there, the key word, mimic. The machines are getting smarter, of course, but experts are divided as to when we'll move from basic AI to the scary stuff of science fiction, if at all. But there are real and relatively immediate threats. Almost 50% of American jobs are under threat over the coming 15 years. And healthcare will probably get more expensive as AI increasingly gets involved in keeping you alive. Well, banks are using it to detect fraud and predict changes in the stock markets. It's used by air traffic controllers to help ensure flight safety in the air and on the ground. It's helping the police forces around the world identify suspects from CCTV images. AI is also helping self-drive cars to navigate our road system. One example, of course, Tesla, with its predictive capabilities. Machines that can identify images are being used by doctors to spot disease. Jobs done by humans are under threat too, and AI is increasingly being used to decide whether you will even get an interview in the first place. So as the future accelerates towards us, maybe worth reminding ourselves that great design and great art, well, that's always been the reserve of us, human beings, biology. It wasn't a machine that gave us the Sistine Chapel, the pyramids of Egypt, or the works of Nizar Kabani. Al Jazeera's Gabriel Elizondo has been to the Designs for a Different Future exhibition. It aims to encourage people to imagine a coming way of life very different to what we have today. It's an art exhibition not about the past, not about the present, but about imagining the future of everything. Like this, 25 collaged passports proposing a system to allow people to temporarily exchange citizenship a critique of a world where goods and services freely cross borders, but where humans often can't. It's one of more than 75 exhibits by designers tackling issues of the future and the human condition at a major new exhibition at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It is a vast show uh, that tries to ask a lot of questions without necessarily giving answers. When you come to an exhibition about the future, you might expect to see things like this, robots. And there is one, this is Cory, that looks at the interaction between robots and humans and artificial intelligence. But this exhibition is also about a lot more. These faces were created from DNA, extracted from discarded cigarette ends and gum on the streets. The designer using the genetic information to render the portraits. There are several pieces related to food, like these two salmon, a larger genetically modified one next to a smaller organic one, and a replica of steaks grown out of human cells from hospital waste. Both provocative ideas reflecting a future where food resources are strained. The idea is to make people think about food as a cornerstone of human civilization and think about what will happen to food and the future of human diet as we start thinking about the big challenges that are lying ahead, like climate change, diversity loss, and environmental pollution. Einstein once said he never thinks of the future because it will come fast enough. In this exhibit, designers are the ones bringing their ideas for the future and not telling people what to think, but rather what to think about. Gabriel Zondo, Al Jazeera, Philadelphia.
OK, let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Maastricht on Skype is Catalina Gowanta, Assistant Professor in Private Law at Maastricht University. She also co-manages the Maastricht Law and Tech Lab in Doha. Eddie borges Ray is Associate Professor in Residence at the Northwestern University here in Qatar and author of Automated Journalism, Algorithms, Bots and Computational Cognition. And in Berlin on Skype, Caroline Sinders is Machine Learning Designer and a Fellow at the Mozilla Foundation and Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to you all. Caroline, can I come to you first? What we have at the moment is, is euphemistically known as narrow AI. What does that mean? Um, I may have be perhaps the best person to uh, define narrow AI, um, but I off the way I try to look at artificial intelligence is through the ways that general uh, product designers and uh, consumers engage with artificial intelligence. Eddie Bourgeois here in Doha. If and when AI gets stronger, is it a done deal that it will outperform us human beings? Well, um, analysts and discussions of this um, idea of artificial intelligence for a while have been um, really overexcited of the, of the idea of um, an, an artificial being being able to uh, take on a number of activities and tasks that we humans prefer not to do. But um, I, myself, uh, through my research, I found evidence that makes me quite skeptic of, of the development of such a technology in the short, mid-term. And Catalina, coming to you, when that happens, how big an event, how strong an event will that be? So I very much echo what was just said, the idea that we're now looking at artificial intelligence as this blanket term that is supposed to really be everything and anything, whereas actually in, in practice, uh, artificial intelligence is right now uh, simply a set of tools that perform these tasks that were mentioned or that were given as examples beforehand. So tools like um, facial recognition or tools and methods like facial recognition, like um, uh, hate speech recognition, and some of these tasks are faring much better than others. Um, and for those that already do very well, we really need to try to understand what particular legal framework is necessary. And um, here it's very important to keep in mind that since artificial intelligence is nothing new, it's been around already for uh, decades, um, we already have quite a lot of rules that can be very, very fitting. So to go to your question, um, it, the, the kind of impact that these developments will have really depend on the accuracy of the methods and also the existing uh, legal structures that we have in place. Caroline in Berlin, coming back to you, where are we with AI as of today? I mean, for you, for example, is facial recognition a worry? Because that's something that we're reading an awful lot about now. I would say 100% it's a worry. AI, for me in particular, I look through it, again, through this lens of consumer, consumer um, understandability and consumer protection. So how, how artificial intelligence is folded into a product or product design. Facial recognition um, through, I mean, there's various studies out there. The one I, I, the one I love to cite is one from MIT by Joy Balami, Gender Shades, which looks at Amazon, um, Amazon recognition, IBM Watson, Microsoft, and I believe Google as well, and looking at how uh, computer vision and facial recognition systems understand gender and then skin tone. Um, recognition, but all of these systems, so Amazon's recognition, had a difficult time in recognizing darker skin tones, so a variety of different races, and a harder time recognizing gender. It performed best with white men. Um, so when we think about like the, the, the pitfalls of facial recognition, we'll imagine, you know, one, the emotional trauma of what it could feel like when this thing fails, perhaps at a border crossing. But then more importantly, what happens when there are failures? What are the workarounds? How is it folded into a design? What happens? What is the extent of that harm? And then going even further, should we be using such error-ridden technology on the general public and for the general public in consumer products? So thinking about for, for the end consumer, um, you know, one, one is the harm of having something not be so accurate, you know, deployed uh, writ large. Two, are users understanding how that system works? Can they understand an opt-in or opt-out? Um, is it explained to them? Or is it kind of obfuscated when it's wrapped up into the product itself? And then three, um, how, how, like, what are the, you know, again, more of these harms 
Um, and is, is it something that they can ever, inside of a service design, opt out? So is it something that's so a part of the flow that they're in, much like uh, different border crossings? If they were to try to not use the product or the technology, one, can they? Is it possible? And two, what are the steps to avoiding it? So I think it's important to sort of see where these products sit um, in the world at large and then how systems are designed around them. So, you know, problems with facial recognition um, as users, are we aware of when it's being used? And are, is there any potential for us to not engage with that? If it's being used in CCTV cameras, no, right? Um, as an individual, I can't have a certain CCTV camera that's using facial recognition not work on, on me as an individual, right? So that's the way I think about it, is what are the cues that users see? Um, what are, you know, how are these systems explained to them? Is it made legible? What is legibility and how does design relate to that? And I think this is a bigger problem even outside of facial recognition, but in a variety of products that use different kinds of artificial intelligence. And this even raises a deeper question of do consumers understand the different kinds of artificial intelligence and then the harms associated with that? And okay. are those harms made Eddie, Eddie Bourgeois here in Doha, what does it do or what will it do to the global workforce, particularly if we contextualise that assertion in terms of, say, you know, if you've got the workforce in China, billions of people who work for very small salaries, but if you've got, dare I say, a more sophisticated workforce manufacturing something else, the impact might be completely different. Well, but um, my question would be, in return, does this technology still allow to, to have a, a more a smarter, uh, a more powerful workforce? Um, to some extent, just to kind of bring it back to the, to the, to, to the area of, of, of my, my recent research on, 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 on the field of journalism, there's been always the belief that, you know, having artificial intelligence embedded in the newsrooms will elevate, you know, journalists from uh, very... Um, time-consuming tasks, but um, and, and free them up to do perhaps more investigative journalism, for instance. Um, and in reality, these technologies, at the, at, as, as they stand, are unable to really produce a new story from scratch. They're still pretty much dependent on human authorization and on journalists writing templates. Um, that's the problem. It's just the, the problem to me is that public perception has been overexcited with, you know, the promises of, of what artificial intelligence could, could create or could produce, but we are not still yet. Catalina Guanta in Maastricht, just to go back to that idea that Caroline Zinders in Berlin was talking about. If you have automated technology here, I'm thinking about, I have, I have in my house automated, an automated cleaner that comes out at one o'clock in the morning. Now, if I program that to clean the house as fast as possible, it might smash the coffee table. It doesn't know what it's done, no harm done. But if you have an automated drone aircraft dropping bombs, the drone has anonymity and autonomy. So the, the potential for catastrophe there is huge. But the overarching principle of writing a program and instilling intelligence is much the same, surely. Yeah, so I'm very happy that you're bringing up all of these examples because they are essential in understanding the differences between the harms that Caroline was mentioning uh, earlier, the different harms that emerge out of different contexts. So uh, if you're speaking about uh, consumer uh, products, so Caroline was mentioning about uh, facial recognition as a um, maybe something that can be embedded, I don't know, in an app like uh, Snapchat. And actually, it is already uh, being embedded there. Um, but, um, but that is very different different indeed than having aut autonomous or automated, highly or partially automated uh, systems that can be deployed in warfare. So that's why, from a legal perspective, it's very important to keep this uh, context very specific because um, the rules that normally apply also to, uh, to these fields, they are also very different. So uh, drones that attack different uh, military forces, that those are going to fall under or should fall in the future under humanitarian law rules, whereas uh, when we're speaking about consumer products, we're also speaking about consumer protection and product liability. Um, and maybe to build on this idea, 
What I think is very important for us to realize is that behind all of these industries and behind all of these markets, there are business models that we have yet to fully comprehend. Um, I'm not sure how many of the um, audience members of today's show will be familiar with uh, companies that do data enrichment, because uh, at the end of the day, in order to uh, deploy all of these technologies, you just need data. So the data harvesting um, approaches of companies can be become more and more, um, uh, more and more uh, uh, negative. So they are going to try to get information uh, about consumers, about uh, companies from many different places. And by they, I mean these data enrichment companies. So uh, this is, it's uh, something very vital that right now is not being co completely explored. And I think that we really need more evidence in this respect. What are the data brokerage models? What are the economic incentives and economic interests that these markets are right now um, uh, creating? Caroline, does that mean that we should limit the intelligence of artificial intelligence because of where it may end up? I'm not quite sure how we could limit the intelligence of artificial intelligence systems, given that artificial intelligence isn't really that intelligent. I think what it comes back to is the intentionality. And as my co-panelist has mentioned, data brokerage, and even going even further, um, thinking about data sets and who maintains them and how open they are, and the anonymity of users within data sets. It's not necessarily about artificial intelligence. It does actually come down to what's making up the AI system and then the context of where it's used. So, um, you know, I think uh, the previous answer was really fantastic in sort of separating consumer products that use automation versus um, weapons and war. Maybe at the very, 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 very base level, they're using a similar kind of system or automation, but um, in actuality, they're made in very different ways, and they're pulling from so many different kinds of things. A big thing would be data sets. So the way a Roomba is designed and the data set it's trained on is probably very different, extremely different than, per se, um, predictive policing software, right? So I think it's more important to think about the data sets and standards around um, what we consider fair or more balanced data sets, like less biased data sets. Caroline, but then also, just, to, again, just to hit the pause the button there for a second, Caroline, when yeah. you talk about data sets, what you're talking about is the toolbox of human-esque decision-making that artificial intelligence utilizes when it has to take a decision on what it does next, depending upon the process that it's involved in at any particular moment. Somewhat, yes. So. Inside of a system, you inside of an artificial intelligence system, you need data. That data uh, interacts with algorithms or the artificial intelligent code itself, right? And then it's trained, labeled, modeled, etc. Um, and so it's not just like it is these human systems. It is also thinking about well, what what is the problem I'm trying to solve, and then what data set did I use around that? So predictive policing, for example, uses historical police data, right? It's using um, older arrest history. But we can unpack how there are so many um, like inaccuracies and even human rights violations within that. Uh, I speak from a very particularly Western context. I'm from the United States and I'm from Louisiana, which has the highest incarceration state uh, or levels in the United States as a singular state. And black people are overly policed in Louisiana. And so what we're talking about, if we look at predictive policing, is a history of inequity, right? Okay. So how accurate is that? That data set, that data set of those pre-arrests, those, um, those previous arrests, that is what is trained, that's what's training these predictive policing systems. So we have to have a set of standards, even in like, what are the different parts of the equation that make up an artificial intelligence system? Okay. Part of that is also deeply looking at the data. Right. Eddie, is there a problem coming for politicians, presidents and prime ministers around the world? Because according to a recent study from Oxford University, 47% of US jobs will be directly under threat within the next 15 to 20 years. So point number one, you're going to have a US president with massive unemployment. Point number two, those people who are massively unemployed, who haven't got a job, they're going to begin to question surely at some sort of socioeconomic, psychological level, what am I for? Because so many of us get purpose and function from having a place to go to during the day where we've got to have a shower, have a cup of coffee and go to work. 
Well, think of artificial intelligence as embedded in many dimensions in your everyday life. Um, so if you were to get home, for instance, and this idea of you know, smart cities and intelligent houses, and pretty much you know, going back to what um, has just been said, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, the, all the training data that we are generating every day um, is replicating inequalities, is replicating, um, is generating exclusion. So to some extent, well, I think we still need to overcome a series of limits um, <clears throat> that artificial intelligence are still posing. There are really interesting initiatives in different countries to start thinking about ethics and um, <clears throat> how artificial intelligence makes certain decisions. But before is artificial intelligence is fully implemented in, in, the, in, the, in the workforce or in the, in the, in the job market, uh, we really need to make sure that it's equal, it's, it's, you know, that doesn't replicate um, inequalities, that is inclusive, and that respond equally to the same group, uh, you know, different groups of, of individuals. And, and that's pretty much my concern. OK, and Catalina, is there another issue as well? When we've got people who are unemployed, their health is generally not as good as when they have purpose. But all healthcare providers around the world are kind of investigating AI. But, and this is kind of counterintuitive, surely. AI will actually make healthcare more expensive at point of delivery because you've got to have nurses and doctors who are trained on AI, and that cost has to be passed on to somebody. Um, that's a very good example, once more, of a societal issue that is, is definitely blooming right now. Um, the, the thing with uh, healthcare and AI um, is, to my knowledge, as I'm not necessarily a health, uh, health expert, uh, is that is again the market. So if there are a lot of companies that really promote uh, what, what researchers in computer science would deem to be snake oil, so products that are supposed to, uh, to create predictions that actually are not very accurate, um, then this is a very superficial inflation of this market that might uh, perhaps result in these increased uh, prices for, um, for health care. Um, uh, payments. However, um, I think the, the medical sector, again, to my knowledge, uh, has provided uh, some of the most um, interesting examples of AI that actually works. So doing, um, uh, doing a deep learning on various scans, for instance, is something that has a, a very high accuracy. And this is what researchers in this field are mentioning. And if that is the case, and this is the future of this industry where we can use uh, automated tools to enhance human decision making, then that is definitely something that uh, needs to be taken into account by the overarching system. Okay. And this brings me to this question of uh, information literacy that perhaps we can discuss with the other participants as well, because this is what you were asking. Should all of these nurses and all of these doctors now be trained in AI? Well, I would like to make a statement that might be a little bit, uh, that maybe the other guests are going to disagree with, but I think that everyone in society should have a better understanding okay. of what AI is, because information literacy is the only way in which we can take our own rights into our own hands. Okay. Briefly, Caroline, in, in um, Berlin, Caroline Sinders, are we heading towards a Rubicon in as much as you have to be a human being, you have to be biology, you have to be 80% water to invent something? But AI is already inventing things. So when you go forward to apply for a patent, you can't get that patent if you're a machine. But when that does happen, you all seem to be saying that will happen, but when that does happen, then the gloves are off. There are so many things to unpack in that question. Thank you so much for it. But I do want to take a second and really re-emphasize what um, Kalina has, has talked about with tech literacy is legibility of these systems. And I think moving forward, that's something that should be so heavily focused on legibility in terms of policy, legibility in terms of design. But then that does bring us back around to your question as a designer and an artist who makes things with artificial intelligence, I view artificial intelligence as an extent of my paint box or my toolbox, if you will. There's already art that's made by artificial intelligence, but a human is more of like the director. Do we think films are any less beautiful um, if the director is directing, but not necessarily right behind the camera, or if the director's not acting in front of them? We recognize that films are a system and a series of components that make up something we're watching. And I sort of advocate that in terms of art, we can think of that as a similar way with artificial intelligence. So 
someone has to make a decision about what how they're going to use an artificial intelligence system in a specific kind of context. Okay. AI um, is is not it like cannot make decision on its own. Um, two really great researchers, Mimi Onawa and um, uh, Diana Naraka, describe AI as like salt. It's a transformative ingredient, but on its own, it's not really that interesting. Salt can't do a lot on its own. It has to be activated or put into something. So we should think about artificial intelligence like that. Um, someone has to decide the new revolutionary way to use artificial intelligence to potentially apply for a patent. An AI can't come up with an idea of what is revolutionary. Okay. Okay. Humans we will. That. We will have to leave it there, but thank you so much for taking us through what may or may not happen with artificial intelligence. Thank you to our guests. They were Catalina Gowanta, Eddie borges Ray, and Caroline Zinders. And thank you to you too for your company. You can see the show again via the website, aljazeera.com. And you can join in the further ongoing discussion on our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. I'm at Peter Dobby One from me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.